Hello, I'm Dr Sarah Pugh and I'm a biochemist and a hypnotist. Today I'm going to do a very short video about the biology behind using food and supplements to help with mental health problems. So I've been very interested in mental health for the past 15 years because I had some trouble in my 20s. I won't go into it now because this is all about you, not me. And I found that the thing which helped the most ultimately was really drilling down and changing my diet. So let's begin. So what is psychiatric nutrition or nutritional psychiatry? Well, it's a fast growing approach that uses food and supplements to treat or manage mental health conditions. So less medication or no medication at all is needed. So let's look at the nutrition side first. And basically, if we think about it, we're all just a pile of food. And regardless of what you think about who created the world and the creator, we can all eat a sandwich in the morning and create some human being in a few hours time. And therefore we use components from our food to make vital brain chemicals like serotonin and dopamine, which are for good mood and motivation. And then we also get fats and proteins from our food that are crucial for repairing and nourishing brain cells and nerves. So what we eat most certainly affects our mood the mood and food connection. So let's look at the psychiatry side. So what's the situation with psychiatric medication? Well, about one in six people in the UK and one in five people in the US now take a psychiatric medicine. And about one in four adults in the UK are taking medicines for pain, depression or insomnia. So this is actually quite frightening because it views the brain as a bag of neurotransmitters or brain chemicals that are designed to be manipulated with medicines. And the problem here is the medicines don't always work and a lot of them have got side effects. The problem now is that mental health problems as well as other chronic conditions like diabetes, obesity, food addiction, uh, becoming more and more common and more serious and starting younger and younger. A lot of these health problems has to do with how far astray we've gone with our diets and so many people do not link their mental health to their diets. Our brains are invisible to the outside world and you cannot tell if somebody's healthy or not simply by looking at just their body. You have no idea what's going on with their biochemistry or in their heads. Somebody could look amazing on the outside, but they could be crippled with anxiety or get knocked down by depression all the time. So they're just not healthy and they're not happy either. Just to keep it simple, depression and anxiety, as well as pain, often a warning, a warning that you're doing something that your brain doesn't like. And this thing that your brain doesn't like could be a food, a mother-in-law, a horrible boss, all sorts. But as we're talking about the biology of mental health, we'll focus on food and food is a drug as I've said and some people eat up to six times a day for some reason so if you're putting something into your body that's inflammatory or you're sensitive to every couple of hours then this is going to cause a problem either to your physical or your mental health or both so a quick point here about grazing, nibbling, snacking whatever you want to call it is uh, little pickers wear bigger knickers and regardless of what you've been told about eat little and often to keep your metabolism going, that's one of the worst things you can do. We understand a lot more about the biological causes of mental illness than people think. So firstly, there's inflammation. So this is inflammation on a microscopic scale in the brain. Systemic inflammation, not your brain being all red and swollen. And we know that chronic inflammation is the root cause of many physical diseases and the brain is no different. There are many studies linking inflammation to depression and there are lots and lots of inflammatory foods that people eat which can make their depression worse. Along with inflammation we've got something called oxidative stress. So oxidative stress just means that when the cells in the brain and body are releasing energy from food they can do it inefficiently or go into overdrive and they can create free radicals which are like tiny molecular razor blades and these free radicals can cause internal damage to cells and important things inside the cell like the DNA, the cell membrane, it can even kill cells. So if we take a look at this image here, the tryptophan which comes from food is used to make melatonin and serotonin and these are for sleep and good mood. And some of this 
tryptophan also goes off to make GABA and glutamate in the right balance. Now, GABA is a calming or relaxing neurotransmitter and glutamate is excitatory. And glutamate is important as well, but it's when there's too much glutamate and not enough of the others, that's when the problems happen. So when we have oxidative stress, inflammation, this tryptophan that's been reserved for making serotonin and melatonin gets made into glutamate. And too much glutamate, not enough GABA, serotonin and melatonin lead to anxiety, headaches, restlessness, insomnia, increased sensitivity to pain, inability to concentrate and other unpleasant psychiatric symptoms. So if we take away this inflammation and oxidative stress by making better food choices or following a specifically designed medical diet, then these brain chemicals can rebalance again without the need for any kind and of And we have drugs. also something called insulin resistance, with, which most people associate with diabetes, but thin people, stressed people, young people can all become insulin resistant. And when the brain is insulin resistant, what happens is the insulin itself has trouble getting into the brain and the brain needs insulin for it to be able to use the glucose. So the glucose is just going to come into the brain naturally. So what happens is the brain's swimming in glucose, but it can't use any of it. So we have a problem of energy supply in the brain. Several brain areas are linked to mood disorders such as anxiety, depression or bipolar and these important areas include the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The amygdala is important in regulating emotions and fear and both of these areas have a lot of insulin receptors. Another part of the brain which has a lot of insulin receptors is the hippocampus which is involved in memory. So if a brain's insulin resistant, then these three important areas of the brain aren't able to use energy properly. Now, the other interesting thing is insulin in the brain also regulates appetite. And when there's a problem with insulin getting into the brain, overeating and weight gain are much more likely. And interestingly, an insulin resistant brain is like, more likely to signal to fat cells from a distance, telling them to burn less fat. Insulin resistance is sometimes called pre-diabetes and something like 50% of people in the Western countries are now insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. So pre-diabetes or insulin resistance is simply the body's carbohydrate or glucose metabolizing system is breaking down and malfunctioning which makes it very difficult to handle carbohydrates. Even from whole foods like fruit and vegetables if somebody's very insulin resistant. Putting more carbohydrates or glucose in when you're insulin resistant makes the insulin resistance worse, which all makes the mood problem, the mental health, the weight problems and anything else that's connected to the insulin resistance worse as well. And now we come into nutrient deficiencies, which are quite common in our modern day diet for a number of reasons. And these cause a variety of mental health issues too. For example, a zinc deficiency can lead to depression and a vitamin B12 deficiency can create memory problems or even psychosis. Vitamin B12 is critical for making new blood cells and for the development of the brain and the nervous system. So you must supplement with B12 if you're plant-based because it can take several years or up to five years for B12 deficiency to, to develop. It doesn't happen overnight. Then we have omega-3 fatty acids, which lots of people have heard of and know are good for brain health. And the important one for human brains is DHA, but also EPA. Now DHA, the one which is most important for human brains, is only found in animal products, particularly oily fish, but also grass-fed beef and butter. The plant form ALA, alpha-linoic acid, is very, very difficult for us to convert that into DHA or EPA. This is particularly important if you're pregnant or have a young baby to, to get the right form of omega-3, the animal form, because it's a crucial for brain development. So the metabolism of the brain, the nutrient availability to the brain, how much inflammation or oxidation there is, is primarily caused by food choices. So making bad food choices like processed food, refined carbohydrates, vegetable oils like industrial seed oils like soya, canola, and sunflower 
These are all very easy dietary changes that anybody can make. There are also more specialist medical diets that are tailored for the person's individual needs. Because psychiatric nutrition is important for the young and the more senior. So there are lots of clues to dietary problem in children, like hyperactivity, being ill all the time, dark circles under the eyes, overweight, underweight. And even if you've got a child of normal weight who appears healthy in every way, it's still a very bad idea, very dangerous to feed them children food all the time because children food it tends to be sweetened and processed and sugar is very very damaging to the brain and it will literally put your brain or your child's brain on a path of destruction no matter what age you are and we know from the science it's very very clear that Alzheimer's disease and certain kinds of dementia begin with insulin resistance in the brain. In most cases this insulin resistance builds up decades before any memory problems become apparent. Some people may have heard of Alzheimer's being called type 3 diabetes and once again the brain is insulin resistant. The blood-brain barrier won't let insulin into the brain and the brain can't use glucose so it's effectively starving in an insulin resistant brain or a brain of somebody who's suffering from, from Alzheimer's. So when the brain's insulin resistant, it's like going to a buffet and not being allowed to take your mask off. So there's plenty of food around, you just can't eat any of it. And the problem now with all this extra glucose in the brain not being used, it doesn't just sit there, it non-enzymically glycosylates proteins and other structures in the brain. And this means that glucose just sticks to things and it's like covering all of the molecular machinery in the brain with treacle and expecting everything to work how it should. It makes them all sticky and dysfunctional. And then all these sticky proteins in the brain trigger cytokines and free radicals, which is our own body's natural defense mechanism to try to get rid of these sticky proteins in the brain. And this now produces more inflammation and more oxidative stress on top of the brain that's starving. So I don't know anything about your personal background, but you may, for whatever reason, have eaten a bad diet as a child. So what happens in the brain when you're young is something called neuronal pruning. And in a nutshell, the brain keeps neuronal pathways that you use a lot. Say, something like playing the piano, something that you're learning as a child. Because it's a useful skill, and then it prunes away other pathways that you don't need. So the brain's very efficient, it wants to maximise the how much neuronal space it has, it wants to be efficient. And unfortunately the brain doesn't know the difference between healthy and not healthy. So if you as a child or your children are eating lots and lots of sugar and processed food, it's training the brain to keep these pathways because your brain thinks, oh well we eat sugar all the time therefore this is important so we must keep doing it. And this sugar and carb habit can follow you into adulthood. And then this can lead to things like binge eating, food addiction, and even bulimia. And it's very specific foods that people binge on, like pizza and ice cream. It's never sardines and broccoli or and salmon and rectified as an adult. And your brain and your waistline will thank you for it. There's a lot of misinformation about nutrition and food. And one of them is about glucose, is that our bodies can make all the glucose it needs by gluconeogenesis and this is a biochemical pathway, biochemical process, a fact. So there's actually no need for you to eat sugar or carbohydrate at all because your body can make it, can make its own glucose. And the brain actually prefers to use ketones as, a, as fuel but there are special nerve cells in the brain that do need glucose but as I said before your body can easily make all the glucose it needs out of other things like proteins and, and fats. Because we all have different requirements, there are several dietary strategies to help fuel the brain properly. And this, of course, depends on the person in front of me based on age, activity level, health concerns, culture, and so forth. Another place where the food mythology really takes hold is the plants versus animals for human health. There's just no scientific ev evidence, absolutely none, that animal foods are dangerous to human health. We'll leave dairy aside because I've got my concerns about dairy. We're talking about meat, seafood, poultry. 
These foods are ancient foods that our ancestors ate. Our brains and bodies evolved to obtain nutrients from these types of food. They're the only foods that contain every nutrient we need in the proper form, in the proper ratios, without any natural anti-nutrients. You can look up the stable nitrogen and carbon isotope archaeological studies on human remains that show that for at least the past 350,000 years, humans predominantly ate the meat and fat of animals. A lot of plant foods naturally contain substances that interfere with our ability to absorb nutrients. And plants have these defences in them because they're trying to defend themselves from being eaten because they can't run away. But it's important to note you don't have to eat animals to eat a brain healthy or low carbohydrate diet or a low inflammation diet. Low carbohydrate has nothing to do with plants or animals. It's just a bit harder to eat a low carbohydrate vegetarian diet. So what I'm talking about, these unhealthy biochemical situations, it's to do with insulin resistance, inflammation, food sensitivities, and you can address your mental health, your pain, your diabetes. You can lose weight, get your blood sugar under control without eating animal foods if you so choose, but you must supplement properly. So that's psychiatric nutrition in a short uh, video obviously could go on for days about the, the biochemistry of this but practically it's actually quite easy to make changes in my consultations I show you how to correctly and scientifically construct a diet that's designed to deal with your problems and help you achieve your goals I also teach people how to correctly supplement a diet because there are occasions where you can't get everything from food although getting it from food as often as possible is the best idea. Because food and mental health are quite sensitive topics, I also offer hypnosis sessions to deal with any emotional situations around food or giving you motivation to change your way of eating so that you can improve not only your physical health but also your mental health. Thank you very much for your time and for watching. I hope you found it informative and useful in some way.